What's Underneath is a CastBox original produced in partnership with Studio 71. CastBox is the fastest growing, highest rated podcast app on both iOS and Android, where you can find all of your favorite podcasts. You can listen to What's Underneath wherever you get your podcasts, but we hope you'll give CastBox a shot and see for yourself. Hello and welcome to What's Underneath, the podcast that will inspire radical self-acceptance through empowering you to embrace what's unrepeatable in you. I'm Lily Mandelbaum, and sitting next to me is my mom, Elisa Goodkind. And we are Style Like You. In our new podcast, we are going to expand the types of intimate, unfiltered conversations we've been having in our viral video series, The What's Underneath Project. Each week, we will interview diverse nonconformists about their relationship to style, self-image, and identity. Being radically honest without shame and holding that honesty with compassion is self-acceptance. So, Mom. Hey, Lily. Can you tell us who we're here with? We are here today with filmmaker, artist, and musician, Terrence Nance, who we first found out about because um, Gabrielle Lede, who we did a What's Underneath episode on and who is I, I am very close to and love very much, introduced me to Terrence because she was animating for his new HBO show Random Acts of Flyness and the minute I started to get the idea of how out of this world unapologetic and brilliant this show was I was like uh and Lily and I were we we need to interview Terrence immediately ASAP because uh, now that we've watched the show many times, um, and you could watch it over and over and over again because of how much depth is in each episode, which is so unusual for television. So in my opinion, I feel like it's going to revolutionize television. That's pretty exciting because you're literally sitting there feeling like, am I in a museum? Am I at a show in a haunted house with many rooms am i reading a book because you just kind of can't believe that television would present something that is so deep in terms of exposing race and gender masculinity bodies all of the things that style like you cares a lot about cares a lot about (laughs) but seeing it through the lens and eyes of terrence is pretty pretty mind-blowing and exciting so hi hi thank you (laughs) <laughs> that was very nice of you to say. So have you always been so free and unapologetic in your expression? Freedom, I think I identify with that word. I've never felt constrained in my in, in, in making anything other than music. I think with music is a little different, but with everything else, I definitely feel an ease in terms of just being able to express myself. And I've never felt like... I had any kind of formal idea to adhere to um, that had quote unquote parameters that I was railing against. That's never never been, if it has been something I felt, it was definitely a transient feeling or something that kind of came and went too fast for me to notice. But um, people have been using the word unapologetic a lot. And I I don't necessarily have a relationship to that word because I guess to me that means that there, I would have had some sort of expectation that I am to apologize for something in it, but everything definitely in the show is, I've never felt any kind of like um, dialogue with an audience or, you know, anybody making the show that made me feel like um, there was anything that would offend or necessitate an apology or mm-hmm. a caveat of any kind. So, that's, it's, I, but it, it has been a di- kind of a descriptor that's come up a lot, and I kind of just wonder about it, you know. Well, I think that I love the way that you, I've, I've noticed just in the 10 minutes since I've met you, you take, you're very present and in terms of your response to everything and very careful with your words and don't, and I, I can see that right away, like just even analyzing or answering something and not necessarily taking it at face value. The fact that that necessitates feeling like you have to apologize for something. As a prerequisite to the word. It does really sort of negate the, like the strength of the word in a certain way. And I think Mm -hmm. that's, and I think that sort of undoing and unlearning of all of these things that are just, I think that's what's so fascinating to me about the show. Mm. Where does that come from? Like, (laughs) 
the questioning that, of everything thing? yeah just where do where do you who, what has inspired that like just to have that kind of presence and mm-hmm. you're probably going to question my word confidence but like mm-hmm. um <laughs> but you know i don't know like i admire that like where does that come from i was definitely a child who asked why i only really know that because um my mother told me to stop doing that. To stop that. asking why. <laughs> yeah. All right. Or my father. I can't remember who, but it was, it was a very distinct memory I have of like, I was just like, why? You know, <laughs> like as a mm-hmm. little, little kid. Um, <laughs> which I'm Can sure we get an is because. A few examples of some early whys. Like, I the mean, types of things that you would. Why do I have to clean the gutter? Like, <laughs> what is it? And as opposed to like, you know, the gutter, I don't know, you know, if you're in Texas. There's a tree over the roof. The leaves fall in the, tr- in the gutter. They get too wet. They'll rot. The gutter will rot. Then the water will pool. You know, there's a reason why you should get the leaves out of the gutter. <laughs> but mm-hmm. I don't understand that when I'm set. Like, the abstraction, I'm not going to really understand that. So, like, I can understand what my dad would be like, because you need to clean the leaves out of the gutter and not mm-hmm. explain it to me. But, uh, you know, it's stuff like that, you know, that from my perspective now, it's hard to explain to a child. I know because, you know, I have seven nieces and nephews now. So, mm-hmm. but, but at the time, like, I like the idea that there's a face value. There even is a, such a thing as face value. You know, that I think that, like, I've always felt like somebody that, you know, people experiences energy is like passing through as opposed to like, without re- even having a moment to remark upon like the quote unquote value or even recognize or name things. I've always more been, if I'm to like just analyze myself, just somebody who tries to at least let things pass through without having to like name it or judge it. That's like something. Put it in the box. Yeah. That's just something I'm interested in just in terms of experience, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think because that's just how, I've naturally been, but you know, I think that my parents are those types of people. They're very like, <laughs> they're indignant <laughs> type of people. Like they're not, they don't accept anything. Can we you hear know? more about them and in what ways they're indignant? Um, you know, just like they're news people, you know, they like yell at the screen and like, mm-hmm. they're like um, my, my mother's an actress and uh, she don't take no shit. She's just like that type of person. Like she, she's the person at the protest yelling. Like she's, at the school yelling at the teachers you know this is how you pronounce harambe <laughs> you know like mm-hmm. things like, like she's she's that person so maybe mm-hmm. you, you know it's just learned every you know everything is learned and my dad is that way in his own way you know he's you know like a passive like <laughs> a weird experience you know he's anti-spanking which is good everyone should be mm-hmm. but i don't know he, he clearly felt pe- pressure to do it so he would fake do it <laughs> which is like this weird passive aggressive i'm still not gonna do it <laughs> just like, like he'd say threaten or like or like yeah or whatever I mean, at least my experience of or it like was pat he's not, you yeah yeah he's not really doing it because i know what it really <laughs> feels like it's not this is not it um but yeah i mean he's a he's a news person you know he's a uh a, an information processor in a way that like is just like very he's omnivorous and and doesn't um, choose, you know, he's not like a, I'm into this or I'm into that. Like he has just like a, a, a level that collector's instinct. that's like borders on something unhealthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, especially with music, you know, he's just like voracious, you know? And I think that that kind of like mm-hmm. wide ranging omnivorousness, just like feeling like you have to hear it all. Um, Mm -hmm. just experience it all. He's that way with experience, I think, Mm -hmm. you know. That's amazing. That's an amazing way to be. Yeah, it sure, it is. It can be. I guess, like, to be that open and then with your mom, like, feeling like you can change things, like, just confronting and changing things. I love that idea, like, of asking why. And there's so much to ask questions about. (laughs) Like, there's so much that's, like, I mean, I feel like there's so many whys, like, all the time. Like, why, why things have to be a certain way. So, like, you got to ask it. I, I mean, and it's interesting. I didn't used to be like that. I used to be a know-it-all for sure. Like as a kid, at least my perception of myself was that I was. Maybe I observed my younger brother to be a know-it-all for a long time, and I remember the moment he stopped being that way. 
<laughs> you know, like essentially when he was not a child, you know, but you're, you're, he's older or younger. You said? He's younger. Oh, younger. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't say my older brother was that way, but like, I think we kind of had like a, uh, you know, an arms race of being know-it-alls like as kids, <laughs> <laughs> like it's something like that. Um, but yeah, I remember the moment when it was, I realized it was useless. Like, I don't remember exactly when it was, but some point in childhood when it, like that idea of like, Oh, like you should like ask if you don't know. Like you should just make shit up. You can't remember that exact moment. No, no. I definitely felt like you know you just especially you just socialize as a boy. You know the the value Mm -hmm. the value is like who can be like whose will is stronger at the end of the day. It doesn't matter what you actually know. It just matters the extent to which you convince anyone that you can project the confidence that you know something or you know and that is born out in everything in culture now, clearly. Totally. Um, I think the need to, the need to have to be right too, is like kind of an extension of that maybe is. It is. Yeah, it's exactly that. Really. I mean, I think if you want to stay stuck your whole life, like then you need to, you know, that's like the recipe. And I had that bad, you know, I mean, I mean, I still have have it. I, I mean, everyone, definitely everyone socializes with male privilege has it in some proportion, but like, and I have it because of that for sure. But I do remember a moment when I kind of had a sea change of like, even if I, I still need to like actively combat that <laughs> regularly, if I have any chance at having a healthy interactions with humans, you know? <laughs> so, but, mm-hmm. but, but I mean, all that is like, uh, you also can't really be a, at least me, I, I don't think I, you can make from that space. Right. What you, do you, you have to why be able not? to fail. Why? I want to hear why yeah. you feel that way. You know, you, if you already know, then why is it interesting to make anything? You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, if you already know what it's going to be. Like, the whole... It's just like, I think of, like, making stuff as, like, conversation. Like, why would you enter into a conversation if you knew where it was going to go? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, if you... Why would it be interesting to talk to somebody if you knew exactly what they were going to say back to you, you know? And if, like, you're making something and it's like, I'm going to make it and this is how people are going to react, you know? Like, then why do it, you know? And so, like, I think, and that's, like, also with film I noticed, because I didn't come into film till kind of recently in a way, that that, um, it's, it's dictated, especially the more capitalism industry side of it, is dictated by the pseudoscience of, like, knowing how people will react yeah. to things, you Very know, to formula. the work. Yeah. Well, the, even like if the idea of just more like the basic, you know, there's a whole kind of industry around saying like, if you put this person in the movie and mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. have it like the this name. and, you know, if the story this goes like genre. this and mm-hmm. the data says that people will, you know, respond in this way. And, you know, it, it largely has been a pseudoscience until the actual data companies like Netflix now has data that says like people stop watching when this type of thing happens, you know, like they have, they can read that now, but even that is kind of like, it's still just what happened in the past. Right. You know what I mean? Like Could people change. might tomorrow, you know, just like ants, they might stop eating sugar tomorrow. You know, you never know. It's like, so how was that for you? like navigating this commercial, like, the the buyers of your show like how was it for you to navigate introducing something to them that was so not something that they probably have like not a genre like so not categorizable in like a traditional way and out of potentially some of their I imagine it was out of comfort zones um for people and I'm wondering how you navigated that and like maintained your own center and like vision I wouldn't have characterized as an active process of navigation Mm-hmm. Um, that calls to mind like being in a forest or something <laughs> and like having to look at the stars and figure out where I'm going but I, if I was in a forest that th- that wasn't the nature of the forest the nature of the forest is like more like creative conversation of like what do we want to make you know, why, you know what's resonating with us and I think because we stayed in that forest we just didn't even think about we didn't make any assumptions about their comfort level, mm-hmm. you know, 
after we send stuff, I'll be like, oh, well, maybe they won't like that. But, you know, they didn't say anything. So it didn't really, mm -hmm. none of that, if we had any of those expectations, we quickly realized that they were just like, we were just projecting our own. Right. Fears. Or yeah, fears onto the situation. So you never know how people's experience will contract or expand their ability to understand something in any given moment, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like whether or not, even if they were like hyper kind of like given a whole bunch of notes, like their receptivity or non-receptivity, I, I feel like sometimes has nothing to do with like who they are, you know, mm -hmm. it could just be like anything that happened that day or that year to them or, or what, you know, it just could be anything. You can't predict it, you know. I want to go back to the transition from feeling like you need to know it all to asking why in terms of just what inspired that or what, I mean, that that's like a masculine, feminine, like transition of some kind and an openness that isn't totally typical necessarily of, uh, or, or I shouldn't judge that, but like, I'm just curious, like, I'm curious where, what, why did that happen? Like, do you think, and like what <laughs> happened inside of you and like what was happening in your life or like what inspired that? I think maybe there was a few phases. I think just one big phase I think is watching, just seeing um, older men in my family navigate relationships like as a teen or as and just seeing like you don't get any money for <laughs> like being quote unquote right <laughs> or you know you don't get anything you know it's just like it's that's mm -hmm. I think the first thing and then like um the other thing is just like being in relationships you know um I was in a really long relationship for like 11 years with a Virgo and she <laughs> what are you <laughs> I'm an Aquarius and she was in, really into like the scholarship of relationships for sure. And, you know, I read Wait, the, the what of relationships. This is like the scholarship, you know, like the studies and things like uh, that. You uh, know, I, re I read the emotional intelligence book at some point, like in the last five or six years and read um, more than two and the science of just like all these books. And, you know, just being in conversation, just sort of engaging the more academic side of like how to be relate to somebody in a successful way and mm -hmm. um i think that was another thing that shifted it um but i think that now i'm thinking about it, the longer term thing is just seeing long-standing family relationships and the the conflicts how they how they rise up and resolve or don't and just observing what i would do differently <laughs> you know what i mean just like trying to learn from that you know i think that it'd be an actively learn i could do i can do better with that i think i need to do better and like take the next step and not just observe but just ask more questions like literally ask like i do that now not so much with my family whenever i meet like older people especially who are married i always ask them like or like older just older people who i feel like have some sort of experience with relating to people not even just like loving or romantic relationships right. family dynamics parent i always ask parents and st stuff like you know just more open-ended questions about like how they manage it and work through it. i don't have no kids but you know <laughs> just i think that's the next step you're curious vigilant. about it it's like yeah. something that you're very fascinated by yeah yeah i know i've been married and with my husband we've been together about 35 years and we've been married like 33 years and people are literally like these days like are so like we're like dinosaurs we're like relics mm. people are so interested in like how that happens how did it happen how did, has it <laughs> has it been continuous no sabbaticals yes <laughs> a lo i what? always think sabbaticals are kind of necessary if you're gonna last many that long. <laughs> ins and outs many ups sabbaticals and of goodness yeah, many, yeah, yeah. Sabbaticals many, from sabbaticals. The good. many yeah. many many ups and downs and like almost breaking and and then not and then a lot of a lot of i'm a fighter mm -hmm. i don't I put tell. up i don't tolerate like i don't like i don't give up mm -hmm. and it's and it and it's been sort of a battle in certain ways but 
um, like a hard battle, but I'm like starting to like win the battle. But it's taken, it's taken <laughs> start. A, you're just now starting. Starting to take a long. It's taken a long time. But I think instinctually, like. And but doesn't it have a lot to do with what we're talking about? I mean, I think ultimately it has a lot what to we're do talking that I about. I say to him. One of the things I say to him is recently, him needing to be right yeah. and being too defensive. Okay, you need to be right. Great. You're de- okay. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. Like that's really cool. Like uh, like <laughs> the things that I've learned. Like oh, you do the thing I do. <laughs> what like a little passive aggressive. No, I do. It's more funny because my partner now, you know, she's very like, we don't really, like, we fight occasionally, but it's always like a sheen of like a metatextual sheen, sheen over it of like, because we know how to fight because we've read about it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like this weird. So like when she is right, I'll just be like, I have something to tell you. You're right. <laughs> it's like, it's half a joke within half. Like she really wants that moment. You know what I mean? So have you always... um like been willing and interested in putting yourself and your own like experiences into your artwork and and ha- or has there been any journey of like I don't know feeling um nervous to do that and then putting pushing yourself to do so pushing through any fear of being vulnerable and exposed in any way I think that uh, I'm 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 very impulsive and I think I formalized that mm-hmm. like you know very early on like in college or whenever I started kind of being like, okay, I make art or whatever. In those days, I would like say that like my main thing is to try and obey my impulse without judging it. Mm -hmm. And so my impulse is always just to do it, whatever it is. I think there's also a practical shit there is like, you know, I'm the person who can show up and, you know, (laughs) like that type of thing. Yeah. (laughs) So there's definitely a lot of that, especially (laughs) early on. Um, and then you just kind of get used to doing what you know how to do. Um, but then I think that I do get little random pangs like way late in the process, like for, with oversimplification, for instance. Wait, it's, what, for instance? The oversimplification. Oh, oh, uh, oversimpl- yeah, the, the film that it's about me and I'm in it. At some point, like when it was basically like, almost done, I think I was done and I was like sitting in a theater or something <laughs> and like my mom was there and I just sort of realized. realized right the how diaristic it was and just like normal stuff like you know it has sexual content you know it's like mm-hmm. me talking about sex i'm having or not having and my mom's sitting there or whatever you know like i have like little moments like that but mm-hmm. they're not like remarkable it is it's not, it doesn't take the form of fear just like oh i never thought about that that might be awkward for this person or set of people but also you know with i think most diaristic work it's all it's all a conjecture it was not like quite a lie but it's you can't fit a person into an hour and a half, you know, or anything, you know, it's like not, it's a, it's a, it's a fiction just like anything else that has Mm -hmm. a basis in some things that have actually happened. Mm -hmm. So I don't also get the feeling that like just me being in it means anything about like how revelatory I'm being about Mm -hmm. my existence. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be carried over to anything just like, you know, I mean, I think we've all had this experience of, like, feeling like you're really close to somebody. Like, you're, like, really close friends with them. And then, like, you realize maybe a year later. Or you get in conversation that's triangulated with somebody else they know. And you realize you don't, like, know, know anything about them. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that that kind of, that happens because I think people are used to sort of, like, just giving the amount of themselves that they can or is useful to them or, you know, is helpful in any given interaction. Right. And if art is conversation, I think that that happens in that way too i am super excited to try boy briefs products from tomboy x tomboy x promises underwear that is made to fit you and how you see yourself tomboy x offers bikinis briefs boxer briefs trunks and boy shorts as well as soft bras and racer back bras everything comes in everyday basic colors and fun seasonal prints wherever you fall on the size or gender spectrum Tomboy X offers amazing underwear that anybody can feel comfortable in. Go to tomboyx.com slash style, S-T-Y-L-E, and check out their special bundles and pack pricing. And what's underneath listeners get an extra 15% off with code style. Again, code style for an extra 15% off. Go to tomboyx.com slash style. Can you talk a little bit about what your style says about you? Um, I'm in a, I'm in a reinvention phase right now, of, so I don't know my style is whatever it is right today is not going to be that tomorrow. Uh, but what do you re- What do you mean do you by reinventing? 
what my style previously said about me, I think was like a denial of the body and like this body you're looking at is not me. It's uh, it's just like cool decoration. That's like, I think that's still like who you were I putting am. it on and you didn't feel like it was like an expression of you. No, it's no, just like, like it's just like a gift body. I have. Like this body is just like it just like something like a cool like a fit, stereo. Like he, he was feeling like <laughs> actually like his body wasn't his like from a philosophical standpoint. Oh, okay. Yeah. What do you want to elaborate on that? I mean, I still feel that way. I think that you know my my experience of my body is it's just like a gift that I it's like cool house I'm living in. You know, I get to lease it and it's nice and <laughs> you know it's not it's not like but it isn't me you know what i mean it's and it's more than anything it's like a it's an intermediary and a, maybe a in, a in the best case a tool um it's like a language maybe even in and of itself and so i think that like with that idea i didn't have so much of a relationship to like adorning it in like a super specific way because it just never felt like um you know, you just got to kind of put stuff on it so people don't get freaked out type of thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, as opposed to anything past that, you know. Did you always have that feeling, like that awareness that you're, like that... Your body was a gift? Yeah, that your body's Leasing. just here temporarily. I mean, that's a very, like... I mean, I totally understand and agree that we're all, like, just in the... Like, we're, what, we're spirits in these bodies or... Can you talk more about that? Like, and how long you've had that sort of awareness or if you thought about it yeah i mean i thought a lot about it um the first time i ever had is just like I, I didn't really i felt very strange answering to my name for a long time like as a, one of my earliest memories so i don't know how old i was but i was before i could really talk was i remember thinking all the time who is terrence like who are they talking to <laughs> i have no idea who they're talking to <laughs> and uh <laughs> You know, especially you have a lot of brothers and sisters. Everybody is saying your name a lot to get you to not hurt yourself or whatever, you know. And I got that they meant me, but I didn't understand why that was like. It, it took me a long time to understand that's just like the name of my body. You know yeah, what I mean? Your body. Yeah. yeah, that's not like my name or even the idea of having a name is sort of like too much of a commitment <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or something you know, <laughs> um, for a non-embodied entity. And I had a lot of like kind of existential experiences of like, who am I really without the aid of any kind of psychedelics, you know, just like mm -hmm. as a young person, like as a teenager. What are some of the assumptions that you think people make about you based on your appearance and style? And that I smoke weed, <laughs> that I'm from... California. <laughs> um, I, I don't, I don't, I never had any thought about what they would be until people tell me. So I'm just telling what once mm -hmm. people have told me. Um, that's pretty, basically it. <laughs> yeah, Smoke weed in California. Yeah, there's no, which neither is true, but uh, I'm not against smoking weed. I just, I, it's not something I do regularly, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's just interesting. It's more that people think I have, like, like I'm the plug. Like <laughs> people think that I, mm. like I can supply, the, you know, but <laughs> I never am that. So <laughs> I'm disappointing people a lot. What would you say has been your biggest struggle? Self-discipline in general, you know, just like, I think the definition of self-discipline is like really, like, you know, you're kind of taught it means getting up at 6 a.m. It's like a militaristic idea, um, but of, of like your daily schedule or something like that. But if you kind of more reduce it to like consistency with engaging in um, that which expands you, mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. figuring that out is one thing. <laughs> then, mm -hmm. And then just being able to like manage energy to get it there consistently is like. I just feel like I don't have enough life to really get to where I could be. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I mean with that? I so relate to that. But, uh, yeah, everybody. That's, I think that's the biggest battle for almost anybody, especially by kind of like in a, in a more free-form type of lifestyle. One of the producers on the show, Kelly, was like, you don't like rules, Terrence. I was like, I love rules. What are you talking about? 
And like five people converged on me like, Terrence, you don't like rules. Why are you even trying to have this? I was like, I love rules. What are y'all talking about? You know? And they're just like, I realized their subjective experience of me is essentially that I feel like I'm in prison all the time. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know why y'all think I feel that way, but I am the type of person. If somebody says, this is how it has to be. I say, why? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to know, you know? And to them, it's kind of like, I realized to them it, that reads as like dislike. But to me, what I dislike is like hypocrisy and like, which I think everyone probably dislikes or arbitrary constraints. Mm-hmm. I love hyper rational things that help us expand or, you know, direct us <laughs> towards, you know, expansion. Like that's all great. And that's a rule, you know, I have mm-hmm. rules for myself. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. I don't eat a lot of foods you right. know what I'm saying? because <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, be a, feel a certain way. You know what I mm-hmm. mean? There's all kinds of, extremely helpful i think guidelines and regulations are necessary so you know most of the ten commandments are fire you know <laughs> like really you really shouldn't kill people you know mm-hmm. the the idea of freedom is is sort of like at its best in, in the context of self-discipline about um guiding guiding yourself in a certain way you know Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. damning things and mm-hmm. getting a certain flow going, even just like with the phone, you know, like put that aside. Let me mm-hmm. write, you know, <laughs> let me meditate, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Or even med- you know, meditation practice is essentially you, sit, you sitting down there and obeying some rules, you know. At it, its heart, you know, mindfulness, you know, you're doing right like within the normal. structures. The freedom is something that's a very kind exactly. of yogic, and, and and I think that's so true. Like. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment. But at the same time, I like if someone tells me what to do, I I literally <laughs> have to do the opposite thing. How do you have a meditation teacher if you do the opposite of? Well, no, only no, if not, you don't like the rule. If I don't like if the you, rule, like if someone says everyone. you need to wear like you know you need like I used to be a stylist, and if they go, everyone on the set has to wear this. So I was like, there's no way I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> I do that on my sets. I tell everybody that to wear. Um, I say dress formally in the in the cultural tradition that resonates with you the most, which I feel like. But that's giving them yeah a lot of freedom to. That's a that's a good rule. I yeah, mean, that's but it's still a rule. That's you know, still, it's right. still like yeah. dress code. You know? I mean, to me, it's completely ridiculous that anyone can't dress exactly as they want to, wherever they want no, to, they whenever they want to. Like that for me is just absurd. What about what <laughs> about like doctors? <laughs> like think about this why 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 they wear scrubs you don't want to drop a button in somebody right. while you're giving a epi, uh, uh appendicitis my you know. friend who feels exactly like i do about this has designed a line of scrubs yeah <laughs> for doctors that are cool but i'm saying a doctor <laughs> if they came in like dressed like you right now they can't you don't want to drop an earring yeah. True. <laughs> i would be such a mess as a doctor i would be like wait a minute or my surgeons, earring fell yeah. out um i have 20 layers on Someone i can't get to this their, your yeah. earring inside of them yeah. yeah no i know and like i actually really love uniforms <laughs> everybody has duality i really yeah. love uniforms i think uniforms yeah. are amazing and uniforms look for the most part so much better than like how most people choose to dress these two, uh, anyway, like, uh, you know, that's in this true. very conformist, formulaic, fast fashion, whatever it is, bullshit that's going on, I'll take a uniform mm-hmm. any day. Yeah. Um, so, like, I think it's way chic, way, like, cooler, you know, just amazing. The uniforms mm-hmm. are amazing. So, yeah, I'm being a total contradiction. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So, next question. Yeah. What's your biggest fear? My mother dying or my father dying. I mean, that would just be terrible for me. <laughs> for a while I mean I know it would, it's gonna happen so it's also like but I think if like I can imagine a terrible day that would be the worst possible day mm. you know so and I've been blessed to have them this long so what what do you feel is like um, a risk you've taken in your life I haven't really taken any risks I mean <laughs> I t- <laughs> I take the path of least resistance pretty much. (laughs) No, but seriously, like, I don't think that, like, it would have been a risk for me to, like, I mean, really just do anything else with my life. Like, I'm really just doing the thing that it comes easiest to me. 
like in all in my full truth Mm -hmm. like i'm doing the thing that is my whatever my impulse is and Mm -hmm. i think it would be very risky for me to like try and do anything else that was (laughs) outside of that i would you know it'd be a risk i wouldn't take which is why i didn't take Mm. it (laughs) did you ever like consider that yeah i mean like like not it's so fleetingly that i used to tell my parents i wanted to be like an architect and then my aunt took me to some architectural firm and i realized that you can't just draw your own house and they were like i, yeah, I was like oh i just, i guess i'm not doing that <laughs> you know like i had like that kind of feeling like maybe i was gonna try and like do like something engineering related like i feel like i, I do like the idea of um kind of engineering in the broadest sense Mm -hmm. like solutions but the actually day-to-day of it doesn't rock with like what i am interested in so have you ever felt afraid or nervous to be doing something without the security of i don't know a state when you before hbo was involved and you're doing your own things and even now like that doesn't feel like a risk to you because it feels so natural, like to just be on your own artistic path. Yeah. I mean, there's the whole being broke of it all, but you know, I'm used to being broke. So <laughs> it's not like, especially when you grow up without money, it's like, what's new. You know what I'm like you're not, you're not kind of in this. I was never in any kind of like super acute state of fear around that aspect of it. When do you feel the most vulnerable? I feel very vulnerable when I think when just like, it's important to me that I'm like a good family member. And so like I'm hyper, I care about what they think, you know? So it's like in having to have any kind of serious conference, emotive conversation with anybody in my family is when I feel most like this could go anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? That type of feeling. Like something honest that might be charged that, yeah. that you feel you need to express. Yeah. Nevertheless. Yeah. You have to do it. You know, there's no not doing it, you know? That's, that to me is like the only time I feel like I could get hurt here. <laughs> right. <laughs> something, like you know something what I mean? that you can't swallow or push down and yet you're worried about the outcome. Mm-hmm. You're worried about the tension or the conflict. or mm-hmm. M- Namely mm-hmm. probably patterning it for like people watching me. You know, especially like my nieces and nephews. Like if my nieces and nephews sees it like, oh, Uncle Terrence is just say it, you know. Like stepping into He's that uncomfortable hold it place. In. Yeah. Being okay with that. Yeah, I think that that's more important than if the conversation well. leads anywhere. That's a really yeah. good point. And I also think that's so hard for people to do. It is really so, so, yeah, so yeah. hard. Do you have any sources of shame? Not in my conscious mind. I'm sure I, I'm sure I have some that are in there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I haven't. Does anything come shame. to mind? Of like something that you once have had shame around that you feel like you've freed yourself from? I mean, it's just like racism shit, but it's not like not, you know, like when you're like a kid, like, you know, in Texas or whatever. And like the principal, like she acted like the first time I was like in a white school, I was already like maybe 11. I was pretty I wasn't like a little, little kid. Mm -hmm. And I had I'm sure I had some sort of accent. The teacher, the uh, principal kind of you know, this white lady, she sort of acted like she couldn't understand what I was saying. It was, it was like kind of develop, developed this, and a lot of the kids would kind of, they would sort of like, they wouldn't directly make fun of that particular, they would make fun of me in other worse ways, but like it would, it created a situation where I went very quiet. I became very quiet as a mm-hmm. child, like for a long time. But, you know, I ended that. <laughs> You know, like around then, Mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, I was like 14 or so, but yeah, it was just like, (laughs) you're getting back at them now. No, no. I mean, I feel like actually, (laughs) I feel like actually that's like the main thing to like try and not do is just like, not even just like they don't exist for, you know, like not. Give it power. Huh? Not give it power. Yeah. My brother, um. Younger brother, he used to make him and my dad. And my dad's name is Norvis. Him and my dad got an argument about music. My dad used to be a musician, have a little music career, singing career. He's kind of started doing it again. He got an argument with my younger brother about something, and my younger brother moved out. And it was like, for spite, 
started calling his music Norvish Jr. So that basically he's going to like blow up as a musician using my dad's name. And he kind of did, right? <laughs> but then he realized like this is like not a healthy place to be making art from. So he changed his name. You know, it's not like right. to give that animosity energy, you know. And I think it's the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. like. I haven't been thinking about that for a long time. So it's like, you know. What's your definition of beauty? Uh, my definition of beauty is a metric that uh, measures the intent to which you want to seduce or um, disarm or be disarmed. It's like a tool. Like it's like a. Yeah, it's it's an energy or a tool or like something you you emit or receive and the reason you usually emit or receive it is to disarm or be disarmed mm. you know can you give maybe an example of like what you think is beautiful in that in the context of your definition anything that disarms me <laughs> you know like so mm. like for what uh like what? or anything that kind of like eases me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in any type mm-hmm. of any time I'm trying to emit or emit ease you know mm-hmm. that's when I'm attempting to be beautiful or <laughs> you mm-hmm. know that type of thing that's a beautiful answer to beautiful. but it's a tool like any other I don't think it's a tool of privilege above any other tools like ugliness I don't you know Mm-hmm. I think ugliness is probably when people are trying to emit um, abrasion or or armor, a border. Mm-hmm. You know, it's another tool. You know, mm-hmm. if you want that reaction, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. or you mm-hmm. want to receive that. Cause sometimes you know people go see like horror movies. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you sometimes you want that too. You know, right? So it's to like put up an armor. Yeah, which is is not bad or good, and neither mm-hmm. bad or good. You know. Sometimes you do not need to be disarmed, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. or you don't need to be out here disarming people. So, you know. Right. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Like Thanks super beautiful me. and amazing. Thanks for having me. It was good. Really, really appreciate it a lot. No problem. We hope you were inspired by this episode. Until next week, that's it from me, Elisa. And me, Lily. If you agree that facades separate us and being radically honest brings us together, help spread the movement for radical self-acceptance by sharing this episode and subscribing to our podcast. You can also watch our videos by subscribing to our YouTube channel and following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook using the handle at style like you. That's the letter U instead of the word U. And check out our book, True Style is What's Underneath, The Self-Acceptance Revolution on Amazon or at a local bookstore near you. We can't skip ahead to a happy ending or live inside a photoshopped image or an Instagram filter. There's no finding oneself when glossing over the truth.